Uh, thanks so much for coming out to this. My name is Richard Campbell. I uh, have been telling stories about the history of technology for quite some time. I have a site called historyof.net. Uh, where basically I'm just collecting names right now because I have been working on writing the history of .NET for several years. Uh, it's not that history keeps going so quickly. It's that I'm trying to rationalize all the old stuff. It's been like 20-something years. And, uh, you know, you can send three people in a meeting and, and then 15 minutes later after the meeting, ask what was in the meeting. You're going to get different versions. Try that 15 years ago. So it's hard to get all of that stuff lined up. Uh, I come from British Columbia. Actually, I was born in New Zealand. But I live in BC. I moved up. My parent, my father's Canadian, and so I moved up there when I was three. Um, this is, I show this to Australians because you guys think you have your, you know, the market cornered on scary stuff with your, your huntsman spiders and your drop bears. But we got bears too. So this is, my house is on the left. My neighbor's house is on the right. It's just forest and behind us. This is a Wednesday morning. And Wednesday morning in my neighborhood is garbage day. So until I put this camera up, I didn't realize that that guy came through every week just to make see if I'd put my garbage out early, which you'll get fined for doing because he will spread that garbage all over the lawn <laughs> looking for the good stuff. Uh, I make a lot of podcasts. Any Donna Rocks listeners? Oh, yeah, a few in the room. And so you'll also know that the story I just told you is now why, because I sold that house this past summer. And now I live on the coast. So that video clip should have been a bunch of dolphins bouncing through the water in front of the house. Not as impressive as the bear. I do get a black bear occasionally after our apple tree on the coast. So I'll have to get one of those clips. Uh, my friend Carl Franklin started .NET Rocks back in 2002, which means he predates the word podcast by a couple of years. I came on board as co-host in 2005. We've never missed a week. So it's uh, 1,885 episodes now. Then 86 will be tomorrow. And um, talking to .NET people about what they're working on, the different technologies are coming down the stack. I mean, that's part of me writing the history. It's just I've been involved in collecting these stories for 20 years. Uh, Run as radio is the other half of my brain. I, I do a lot of work on the operation space as well. So it's a younger show. It's only 919 episodes in uh, every Wednesday since April of 2007. Because starting an IT podcast when Vista just shipped seemed like a good idea. And relevant to our conversation today was a three-year period where we made the tablet show. And that started in 2011 and then ended in 2014. That was, well, I'll tell you about it a little later on. It'll come up. But let's go and start at the beginning, beginning. If we're really going to start digging into mono. We'll start with our friend Miguel Diacaza in 1999 when he successfully immigrates from Mexico to the U.S. He's a Linux guy through and through, but he really wants to make a graphical desktop for Linux. And so his original company was called Helix, which he couldn't get it, he couldn't use because it's not a copyrightable term. And so, and, they, and the product we we're trying to make was the GNOME desktop, but he eventually renames himself uh, to Zimian. Fast forward another year to the PDC in 2002. So that's the Professional Developers Conference in 2000. This was in Orlando. This is the first time any of us heard the words .NET. That was the original logo. By the way, you'll notice how good this graphic looks. In 2000, the graphic was like 320 by 200. I have a copy of the original one. If you scale it up to 1080p like this, it looks dreadful. So I actually paid a designer to recreate this thing in high res. So I have the only high res version of the PDC 2000. Like I've had Microsoft people ask me for it. I was like, nope, that's mine. Now, what came out of this? This is when we were expecting to hear about the Visual Basic 7. That's what we were all expecting, right? VB6 had shipped in 98, and so it was about two years. It was time for VB7, and that's not what happened. Uh, this is when uh, Bomber came up on stage and announced this, a new platform based on internet standards. Now, we got to set the context of why he said that in July of 2000. In November of 1999, Microsoft was declared a pernicious monopoly by the U.S. Department of Justice and ordered to break up into two companies, an operating system company and an everything else company. And the fallout of that was that Bill Gates resigned as CEO and he became chief architect. And his friend Steve Ballmer, who had been on the path to become CEO at some point, was now made CEO in January of 2000. And his first mission was to stop the company from being broken up. 
And 24 years later, we know he succeeded. It would take him almost two years to pull it off. He wouldn't get the consent decree until November of 2001. So it's July 2000, and a six-month-in-the-job Steve Ballmer has been in negotiations with the Department of Justice to keep this company together. And the whole argument about the pernicious monopoly had been that that they controlled too much of the market, that they kept a lot of secrets, that other companies couldn't work against their products well, they were too closed. And so he wanted to present himself as more open. In fact, the, the next generation development tools that we were working on were originally called next generation Windows services, but they needed to be open now, so it was next generation web services. And so Steve said, we're publishing a new platform based on internet standards. And that included C Sharp and the new runtime, all this good stuff. And in fact, to show how open we are, we're going to publish as ECMA specifications for the language, for the common language infrastructure. These are ECMA 334 and 335. You can go look them up if you want. And a group of folks in the Linux space, not just Miguel, but some of his associates, guys like Reese Weatherly and Sark Friedman, start trying to read through the specifications and see, can we actually unpack a compiled chunk of .NET code and understand it? So the work started almost immediately. This is interesting, right? This is this alternative to Java, a different approach to things. And so uh, Zimian gets formed in 2001, and their business is the GNOME desktop. That's what they're going to try and, and build, a desktop client for Linux. It doesn't go particularly well. 2001 is also when our friend Steve Ballmer says friendly things like, Linux is a cancer. Now, he was actually talking about the GPL and this idea that it attaches to your intellectual property on everything it touches. So this is fine. Everything's fine. And by the end of 2001, he will get his consent decree. But before that happens, our friend Miguel Diacaza, and this is a picture I scraped out of archive.org from the O'Reilly conference in, in July of 2001, where he made this announcement. He is 29. And he says, look, I've looked over these ECMA specifications. I think this is really cool. And we are going to build a clean room version of .NET for Linux. So we don't trust Microsoft, you know, a little sketch. They can do some, they do some bad things sometimes. So we're going to do our best not to touch your code, but we're looking at specifications. We're going to work our way through this thing. We're going to make it work. And that is what became the Mono Project. Mono being Spanish for monkey, right? So he had Zimmy and the company making Mono the project. And they would get there. They would get their first drop and by about 2004. It takes a couple of years to get that together. It's not a simple thing to pull off. And I mean, those ECMA specifications are fine, but they were missing lots of stuff. So it took a while to really work out what was going on under .NET. And understand, especially those early versions of .NET were very Windows-centric. They were wrappers over top of Windows APIs in a lot of cases. And so reinventing that stuff in the Linux content was hard. And in a lot of ways, you know, Miguel kind of ruined his life at this point. Because he's, he's in this weird space, right? The Microsoft guys are all like, yeah, I know you're working on .NET, but aren't you a Linux guy? And the Linux guys are all, why are you working on Microsoft stuff? So there he was, and his merry band of misfits, living in that in-between space trying to make this thing work. Now, eventually, in 2003, Novell came along and recognizing the potential, they, Novell was all into Linux at the time. That was very important to them. And so building out a dev stack for Linux was huge. And Miguel had plans. He had an idea for development environment, all of this good stuff. So Naval acquires Zimian, and they get to work cranking away. And by August of 2003, that's done. And that fall, at the next PDC, and yes, another up-level graphic by me, well, more importantly, my designer, in the PDC in 03 is where we get the, uh, um, we see the first uh, .NET's now been out two versions, but we also get to get our look at the new version of Windows. Now, back in 2001, XP had shipped. It's not the XP that we know and love, or at least remember and love. We wouldn't remember and love XP for a couple of our, you know, service packs further on, but it was a pretty good version of, of Windows. It, it unified the 9X stack and the NT stack, right, which had really happened at Windows 2000. And then we called XP Windows 2000 with the Fisher-Price interface because it had all the nice circles and arrows, and it was pretty. 
Uh, and now there hadn't been an O. And it, you know, at that point, Microsoft was incredibly dominant, hence the whole DOJ thing. So now they got to build their next operating system. And they've been working on it for a while. And the code name for XP was Whistler. Whistler is the name of a mountain not far from where I live. It's north of Seattle. Microsoft people love going up. There's good ski mountain. And so they, they would go up to ski. There's an apocryphal story of Bill Gates breaking down on the 99 highway on the way to Whistler and some guy pulling over and helping him and his friends to get on their way. And he gets his number and pays off his house as a thank you. You know, I don't know if it's true. But the next version of Windows after XP, which was codenamed Whistler, was named after the mountain right beside Whistler, Blackcomb. And because they were at the top of the market, and Bill now had a little more time on his hands, right? He was chief architect. He wasn't CEOing anymore. So he was pushing on this idea of a fully object-oriented operating system. That there is, there is no concept of apps anymore. That you just have your document, and whatever thing you need to do that document, when you click on it, by golly, the right things are just going to appear and make it happen. That was the picture of Blackcomb, and they couldn't build it. And within a year or so, they're like, this is a bit much. So they dialed it back to a more reasonable thing. And that's what we learned about in, in PDC of 03. And I told you about Whistler and Blackcomb, because if you ever get up to Whistler Village, where Whistler and Blackcomb are, yeah, are, you will find that right between those two very large mountains and all their lifts is a massive bar called the Longhorn Bar. And the product that we got announced in 2003 was Longhorn. Longhorn had the four pillars. They had Avalon, Indigo, WinFS, and Aero, which was the, the semi-transparent graphical interface. They did a birds of a, this was one of the first times Microsoft had ever done a birds of a feather, where basically attendees could vote for sessions at the Microsoft event. And the most voted for session of them all at PDC03 for Birds of Feather was Miguel Diacazzo talking about mono. Microsoft wouldn't do it. So Miguel bought a ticket instead. And he wandered around the conference with an entourage of people asking him about mono the whole week. So caused a bit of a kerfuffle. And I know I told the audio folks I didn't have any audio. Actually, I don't need audio for this, but I want to show you a video clip. This is from 03. And you don't really need the audio for it, but it's not a good looking video. It's very old. That's my friend Carl Franklin with the guitar there. That's the co-host of .NET Rocks, the guy who started it. And the lead singer is a guy named Don Box, who is a development tour guy who's been working for Microsoft for years. And he is singing a version of the song Michelle, re-lyriced to be Miguel, to encourage Miguel to join Microsoft. He even gives him a rose. So he say, there's Miguel standing there while Box sings him a song saying, Miguel, Novell, these two things do not go together well. Anyway, Miguel doesn't join. And uh, PDC 3 uh, ends. That was at a bar in, uh, in Los Angeles during the conference. Let's talk about Over the Edge. You've never heard of them. This is in 2004. This was a gaming group. They wanted to do cross-platform games. They already saw the opportunity in the fragmentation of the market. Can we write a game runs and run multiple places? Their choice of language, Python. So they want to make games in Python. But having discovered the challenges of Python in multiple platforms, they contact uh, Zimian, now uh, under Novell, saying, hey, we like what you're doing with Mono. Do you think you could work with us? to try and, uh, and help us do cross-platform game development. And Miguel's like, yeah, absolutely, it's a great idea. This is a company that would later be renamed Unity. And Miguel would now have a reason to build a devs tool to help them work, uh, to do this work called MonoDevelop. Now, Novell was on some fairly challenging times, and by 2006, Balmer, I mean, I think this is not necessarily an opportunity to rehabilitate his image, but he actually, in Microsoft invests in Novell. They buy a ton of Suze licenses, kind of give them some cash, help them out uh, to keep going. So everything's going to be friendly. $240 million worth. And they also deal with some patent violation things. So this is still before the real patent uh, collision has end, hasn't ended yet. I mean, they don't look excited to be together, really, do they? But anyway, there they are. So Microsoft's trying to collaborate with Linux by 2006. 2007, the uh, phone market gets turned upside down with this, this phone, this terrible, terrible phone. We forget how bad the original phone was. It was a 2G phone in a 3G world. 
And then, then there was the whole skeuomorphic design thing. But it was popular, and it was popular fast. And uh, on the edge, gaming's like, oh, we got to build iPhone games. Like, that's what this is all about. Like, iPhone's going to be huge. And of course, our friend Steve Jobs, rest in peace, said, if you're going to write software for the iPhone, you're going to write it in Safari. Because Jobs had seen the future, and the future was HTML5. And so you were not going to need to have direct access to the iPhone. You could do everything in Safari. And he was wrong. And within months, we had jailbroken the iPhone. We basically hacked it, and now we were going to be able to sideload software into iPhone. And in response, Apple released their internal development tools, Xcode and the like. That's why they were terrible, because they were internal tools, and invented the App Store as a way for them to vet all software that would end up on the iPhone. They were essentially forced into it. And OTT what started out on jailbroken devices until this whole App Store model came down. Then they're like, okay, well, we're in for this. This will be the way to go. We have the store model now. We can build games. We can put them through to the store. We don't have to deal with the mobile thing. So they rebrand as Unity, and the Mono team makes Mono for iOS. So they're now taking C Sharp and compiling it for, the I for iOS devices into Objective C. Profound capability. And so that you know, Unity is at the forefront of that right from the very beginning. It's 2007, 2008. Speaking of 2008, we get another PC back in Los Angeles again. This time, Miguel is invited to present and presents Mono uh, to iOS as a compiler as a service, but also presents the idea of you know, couldn't we go fully native on this? There's more capabilities here, so he's already thinking deeper into what Mono could do in terms of all the different platforms it could run on. PDC 08, also where another new product gets announced that everyone's pretty excited about. Uh, in the fallout of Vista, a bunch of things got pushed out of Vista at the last minute that ended up as a part of version of .NET, of .NET 3. Those, uh, those pillars that used to be in Longhorn of Avalon, Indigo, and, w, uh, and WinFS. Avalon, because it had such a great code name, gets a terrible product name, Windows Presentation Foundation. And Indigo, again, great code name, gets Windows Communication Foundation. But in part of the roadmap for WPF was this idea of it not just for Windows, could run elsewhere. They called it WPF Everywhere, WPFE, which is a terrible code name. But if you have a terrible code name, you get a good product name. Now, actually, the first version of Silverlight didn't have any C-sharp in it. it. Didn't have .NET in it at all. The first version of Silverlight was built for Netflix. Netflix had been in the, in the red envelope business. They shipped DVDs around for you to watch movies. And Reed Hastings included the idea the internet might be a thing. And so I want to now stream movies to you and charge you a fee and not have to do all that shipping anymore. And so he went to Microsoft and said, listen, the internet's not that good. What we need to do is take a given movie and encode it at different resolutions and have a player on the client side that can help us understand what the current pipe speed is and shift between the resolutions. Again, all stuff we take for granted. But in 2008, this was absolutely bleeding edge. And so Windows Media Services on the back end in IIS would stream the movies and the original Silverlight client would be the front end to change the bit rate as necessary based on your bandwidth available. And there were great demos of showing you a high resolution, a 720p version of a, of a show, and then the bandwidth would get constrained and it would drop down to a 320. It was actually a, raw, a, a rabbit cartoon that they were doing that with. Now Silverlight would then evolve into the MVVM product we now know and love with the C Sharp and all that good stuff. Right off the bat, it's running on both the Mac both Intel and PowerPC versions. So if you think about that, that means they had a chunk of .NET running on the Mac in 2008. They're also iterating independently of the rest of the dev stack. You know, back in those days, you only got a new version of .NET and the libraries with a new version of Studio, which was every two to three years, right? We had a 2005 edition, then we had a 2008 edition, then we had a 2010 edition. And they wanted to move faster than that. So they started deploying, shipping new versions of Silverlight through CodePlex, Microsoft's uh, supported SourceForge alternative 
places for them to place code. And so four major updates on Silverlight over the, ten year, uh, over the first 10 months. By the way, any ideas where the name Silverlight comes from? Because there was another motivation for them to build a good web client you know, with good animations and controls and so forth. If you're in, in the, you talk about old school photography, the one with still film involved, and you actually need to have a, a, a traditional flash mirror, those little Instagram cube, the, the cubes where they, they, they would flash and then they'd rotate and you get like four flashes from the given cube. The debris that's left inside that cube after you flashed it, that's called silver light because silver light comes after flash. I'm not clever enough to think this stuff up. I just found it. Uh, Mono got funded by Microsoft to build a version of Silverlight for Linux called Moonlight. And so Moonlight was going to be the Linux version. They got up to about Silverlight 2, it's about as far as they got with that, before the headwinds really hit in. Because let's face it, uh, Adobe was causing some trouble here. Now Adobe had modernized the Macromedia product that was then known as Flash to call it Air, like it was going to be lighter by changing the name. And you know that didn't really solve the problem all that well, but they're trying to run Flash out of the browser. They got their own scripting language in ActionScript. As long as it's running on a PC, you know, plugged in with lots of memory, it goes pretty good. And in the meantime, uh, Miguel has figured out that, hey, we can release Monotouch, 400 bucks a seat for devs, you write code that runs on the iPhone uh, in C-sharp at scale. So this is the chain, the real product that Novell is now selling uh, is Mono for iOS. 400 bucks a seat for devs, make iPhone apps with C-sharp. It's 2009. Then the big iPhone arrived. So this is a tough year, 2010, tough year. So the iPhone, the iPads announced in, in March 2010. They don't have it yet, but they're showing it off. Everybody freaks out. Like it, it's profound. You, you got to go back there and realize what computers looked like at the time. Phone, the phone screens were still small, three inch, two and a half, like they were not big. Laptops, there was a race to make the sub thousand dollar and ultimately the, the $500 laptop. And the way you did that was by making a really crappy laptop plastic, bulky, just like cheap, ugly machines. And they were running around six, $700 at that point in 2010. And then Jobs holds up this work of art, this beautiful eight inch screen, thin, gorgeous device, and it's 800 bucks. And just blows that market apart instantaneously. He hasn't even shipped the thing yet. He's just showing off the prototype. He's good to go. The next month in April, Microsoft re releases Studio 2010 and Silverlight 4. And Silverlight is the way for companies to build cross-platform software internal to their company. You need that plugin to run an IE to make it all work, but that's going to be fine. Everything's good. We're fine. It's excellent. And then Jobs puts out a little letter called Thoughts on Flash. Just thoughts. So what did Thoughts on Flash say? Thoughts on Flash said, listen, this whole plug-in thing, it's bad. And he wasn't wrong. If you were in the business in 2010, every holiday season, when you had to visit family, job number one when you arrived at home was to replace all their address bars on all their browsers. Because inevitably, over the course of the previous six months, Every single normal mortal person had clicked on something that had replaced their address bar with some kind of malware. It was a plugin. Now, we also know that the, uh, the most popular plugin of them all at the time was Flash. And Silverlight happened to be a plugin as well. So, with thoughts on Flash, now, Jobs had another motivation, which was that Flash murdered the battery of the iPad. Like you could watch it go down while you're watching Strong Bad do his thing in Flash animation. So he wanted to protect the iPad. He made a very valid point about security problems on the web. Plugins are dead. Silverlight's in big trouble. And it's not like Microsoft wasn't betting on Silverlight because this is right at the same time that they put out the new phone. 
Microsoft had been building phones for years at this point, but they generally built them for vendors. WinCE was a customizable version of the operating system. You could basically pick a chipset and set up. It would generate a version of the OS for you, sell your phone your way you want to, up to C 6.5. But now they've got to have a response to iPhone and Android, so they, they revamped the whole thing. And the programming platform for it is a stripped-down version of Silverlight. It won't be for very long, but for a little while, if you were a Silverlight person, you were feeling pretty good. We'd had several versions put out. We could deploy to the Mac and, the, and Windows devices. Like, it looked really good. And now we had a phone. You could program a phone with Silverlight. It was awesome for like six months. Six beautiful months. Anyway, by 2011, Mono, the Mono guys figured out how to actually do C Sharp through the JVM into Android. So now they have Mono for Android as well as uh, Mono for iOS. The fall of 2010, Microsoft had their last PDC. That was the PDC where there was no Silverlight at it, which is weird because in April of 2010, Silverlight was all the thing. And all of a sudden, there was no Silverlight. Now, I, I happen to know because I'm working on the history why there was no Silverlight sessions. Nobody submitted any because the Silverlight team at that point had basically been dismantled. They'd been pulled into the phone team. They'd been pulled into the Windows response to the iPad, which was going to become Windows 8 at some point. And so, you know, PDC being an internal conference only, it's only Microsoft people to put the sessions in. There was nobody to put them in. And Mary Jo Foley asked Bob Muglia, who was a set of service and tools, hey, how come no Silverlight at PDC? And Bob said, and he didn't know he was the first person to talk about Silverlight since April. I've asked him, well, you know, our strategy has shifted. Which was true. They just had neglected to tell us. And so that got translated into Silverlight is dead. And everybody got a whole bunch of anxious. And there's lots of folks who are still angry about that. I mean, there are people who bet their careers on, I'm going to push Silverlight throughout my organization. Like, this is going to be the new way to go forward. And then abruptly, without plan, and with no mechanism to migrate over. And their response when we got upset about that is, well, you got 10 years support. What are you complaining about? And they did. They put out one more version of Silverlight, Silverlight 5, which shipped in 2011 and was supported until 2021, by which point there was no place you could run it anyway. So... Mono for Android gets released, and suddenly what Zimian is doing is pretty impressive. You know, they've got a really interesting cross-platform play on the client. Now, this is 2011, so we just had our first build conference ever. So this is the, the end of PDC, the beginning of build, and it was in uh, Anaheim, and Carl and I went to it. And just like there have been no Silverlight sessions in PDC 2010, we go to the Build Conference, the New Developers Conference in 2011, and there's no .NET sessions. They're just talking about WinJS and Windows 8. And we came out of the conference center and I said to Carl, you know, what if .NET doesn't rock? We kind of got a show called, you know, .NET Rocks. So we made a backup show called The Tablet Show. You'll notice if you saw that slide, Started in fall of 2011, because we'd just come out of build. And also, I didn't know where to put tablet development stuff or mobile development stuff, because it wasn't .NET, right? Even though, you know, Mono for Android and Mono for iOS was all C Sharp, it wasn't .NET. And so, we, there was a place to put that stuff. Now, a few years later, we'd figure out that .NET does rock and everything's fine, and we'd roll that back into .NET rocks. Those were interesting days. Speaking of interesting days, Novell had run out of money. And so a company called Attachmate came along to buy Novell up. And, now, and the shareholders went for it. And the new leaders at Attachmate fund from banks to take over Novell. They're looking around at maintaining assets and value, and they realize that that whole mono project isn't making any money at all. So they tell Miguel, hey, we need you to lay off your whole team. And when you're done, why don't you lay yourself off too? And just, we're going to shut this down. And so... Miguel says, ah, that's not a good idea. So he calls his friend, Nat Friedman, and they negotiate with Attachmate. They try and buy Mono from Attachmate. 
Now, and I remember Miguel, we were around that at that time. Miguel had basically, have, as he was laying all his whole team off, he's like, please don't get a job right away. Just hang in there, take your severance, give me a few weeks. I'm working on something. He was trying to make this happen. Attachmate wouldn't sell him on it. They thought it was too valuable. Not valuable enough to work on, but too valuable to give to them. And in the end, they were able to negotiate a unlimited use perpetual license for Mono. That's how they got it back, essentially, and formed a new company we all know called Xamarin. So Xamarin's formed, raises $12 million or so forth. We have that build event where everybody freaks out. By the way, this is also where the consent decree that, that Balmer had negotiated in the first place ends. So that whole 10-year period's over. This is sort of a pivotal moment. They're trying to respond to the iPad by presenting this idea of a weird version of Windows. The leadership has decided that all these other languages are unimportant. JavaScript is the lingua franca for all things. The only thing you can't program with JavaScript is Windows, so we're going to fix that with a library called WinJS, which everybody hates. Well, there's two guys who like it, but that's about it. It's, a, it's like, you can call it JavaScript, but when you look at it, it don't look like JavaScript. Like, it's its own weird thing. Now, this is just the preview of it. They're not actually shipping in 2011. We kick off our other show. Uh, this is also when Anders Halsberg steps down from leading C Sharp, just coincidentally. Now, he was going to go off and work on TypeScript, and that had been on his mind for a while. But you got to think about the hits we'd taken in the past two years. From the debacle around Silverlight to this whole thing with, te with .NET, and then, and then there goes Anders. Now, Mads Torgerson, who's here, takes it over from, from, uh, from Anders and does a phenomenal job, right? Mads is amazing. But it was very scary. And at the time I said on .NET Rocks, what I, I think maybe the only true believer left to see sharp is Miguel Diacaz, and he doesn't work for the company. But he was making C Sharp run on iOS and Android. So pretty compelling moments. Now, again, that time we were very scared. By this time in 2012, when they actually ship Win8, they've set up an app store. Everybody was supposed to write apps in the app store for it. And they were expecting it to all be WinJS. And it's all C Sharp and XAML, 80% of the apps. So you hadn't given a lot of love to the .NET people, but they're still the ones who populated your store in the end. And so didn't work out the way they planned. Steve Zanofsky leaves the company. Steve Ballmer ends up doing the keynote. Uh, WinJS makes it to version one and then pretty much just will end up heading over to, to open source land and be left behind. And Anders announces the first incarnations of TypeScript. And you, gotta, you know, at that time, Microsoft thought everybody at open source hated them, which is not far from the truth. Like, they were not very popular in the open source world. And Anders is not an open source guy. He never has been. That's not the way he thinks. He's a tools guy. That's what he cared about. When he, he got brought from Novell to Microsoft to work on Java tooling in the 90s. It was only after they had the cease and desist from some Microsoft and couldn't do anything with Java anymore. They said, well, I can give you a Java alternative and made C Sharp and became a language job. Up until then, you know, he implemented various versions of Pascal. He did Turbo Pascal, he did Delphi. Like inventing a language from scratch was not necessarily on his playbook, but it was a time and they needed it. You know, he, he transformed himself to make all of that happen. And so now he makes TypeScript. He just puts the prototype on their 0.8 version. And the open source community loves it. You know, pre-static type checking for ch JavaScript before deployment. Brilliant. And the community starts building add-ins to support it, all these different libraries. And inside of Microsoft, they're sort of staggered, like, open source likes us? Like, what's that? That's just weird. They don't even know what to do about that. Meantime, Xam uh, Xamarin's got its feet under. It's raised a bunch of money. You know, Nat Friedman's a good startup guy, and he starts acquiring companies. They buy this company out of Denmark called Less Painful Mobile App Testing. Uh, you would now know it as Xamarin Test Cloud. So they sort of acknowledge that the biggest challenge in mobile development, especially cross-platform mobile development, is too many phones, right? There's no dominant phone. You know, iOS, the, the iPhone's pretty good, but there's still several of those. The Android phone is hugely fragmented. On, on the show, we used to talk about the drawer of broken dreams. You know, you make it work on one Android phone, you know, like that. That time would be like the Samsung S10. 
And then when, it's, when it renders beautifully on that, then you pick up the next most popular phone, you know, one of the Pixel phones. It doesn't quite work right. So you tweak it a bit to make it work right on that phone. Then you go back to the S10, make sure it still works right on that, and you got to tweak it again. You get working on two phones. Then you got to go back to the drawer of broken dreams. How many phones are in the drawer? Like 60. So Xamarin and Test Cloud was at, what they'd actually done in Boston, no less, is they'd rented a cooled space and they had these wire mesh racks with every kind of phone sitting on top of it with a camera pointing down on it, wired in so that you could, for a fee, simultaneously test your app on 100 something phones. They just, every time new phones came out, they would add it to the stack. It was madness, but it worked. And it helped people actually get successful with apps. Today, we call this the Visual Studio App Center, and they've re-architected a bunch of things. There's better simulators and so forth of that. But at the time, this was the profound thing. So Xamarin lifts themselves up as like the way to build mobile apps uh, natively, but in a cross-platform capability. So let's talk about the real transformations of Microsoft. By 2014, the next build, so this is the third build, new leadership, Satya Nadella. Satya got the job in 2013. Now this is his first time on stage. One of the first things out of his mouth is, Windows is free on devices with screens nine inches or smaller. Not an accident that he said that out loud, right? Why was he saying that? He wanted to let everyone know, we're not a Windows company anymore. We're not operating system first, we're a cloud company now. And so to the point where we will give away the thing we used to never give away. They're also going to be open source friendly now. This is when they announced the .NET Foundation. This is when TypeScript 1.0 comes out. And this is where Anders walked up on stage and they released Rosalyn, the compiler as a service for C Sharp, on GitHub as open source and cross-platform. Again, not things that Anders were particularly interested in, but it was important for the company to go that way. And that all happened in April of 2014. So really a pivotal moment have all of those things come together. We really thought this would be the point where they would, oh, and we bought Xamarin, but that didn't happen. Not yet, anyway. Xamarin does another raise. They, they'd done their 12 million raise when they first set up, then they did another 60 million a, a year or two later. Now it's the fall of 2014, they raise another $54 million. And they're worried they're not gonna be bought by Microsoft. They're a little too, Microsoft centric. So they're trying to look at alternatives, like what could they do? Microsoft also announces that they're gonna rewrite .NET, which is its own kind of crazy, but they've come to appreciate that if we're gonna be cross-platform and open source, the, the existing code base for .NET is, it's impossible. There's so much of it that's completely bound to Windows. There's so much of it that's tangled in wear licensing. Let's just start over. So they announced it in 2014, but it'll take them a couple of years to actually get there, about 18 months. They are also learning to develop on GitHub to actually develop that way. Now, but then they'd be doing all the development inside. Even when they had Copeplex, development would happen internally and then they'd publish builds to Copeplex. They'd take feedback, but all of that interaction would happen inside the company. Now they're gonna do it in public. And they sucked at it for first. It took a while to learn how to do that well. So that's, I mean, one of the reasons Core took so long was those years from the fall of 2014 until the first builds come along, in 2016, they're just figuring out the new way to write software, changing the company culture. They also have Roslyn, which means for the first time ever, the guys who are building C Sharp are writing in C Sharp. Up until then, they've been writing in C++. So they may have known C Sharp, but they didn't code in it every day, and now they were. And that's gonna transform C Sharp too. Xamarin buys a company called RoboVM in 2015 out of Sweden. What is RoboVM's gig? Java to iOS. Xamarin starts to build out a suite of Java tools so that you can use Java to go to iOS and to Android the same way you can use C Sharp to go to iOS and Android. So they're building up a suite of alternatives and they start negotiating deals with Oracle who now owns Java because Sun's long gone. So they're starting to work with them. And that, I mean, they're also working on a Swift to Android solution too, because Swift is pretty cool. So they've got some options there. Studio 2015 comes out. This is also when we get Windows 10. Microsoft very much riding the ship of all of those things. 
Um, there had been a version of Studio before this that most of us forget about, the 12 version, which was the version where you had all uppercase menus, which everybody hated, and the 2013 version where that went away. In 2015, kind of the foundational version of, uh, if you look at the past few versions of Studio, they all stem from 2015. So we're back in a dev cycle. We're more open so centric. We're working closely in the, uh, across platforms. We're trying to figure out how to be better with Linux, and those things are evolving. Microsoft goes deliberately into the open source community when they build Visual Studio code. So TypeScript was kind of a surprise that it was well received. And they were glad that it worked out that way. But now it's like, can we build something open source from the beginning intentionally with community involvement to do the right thing? The answer is yes. They make Studio Code rapidly becomes the most popular editor on the planet, for better or worse. Now, I'm not saying they didn't make some mistakes along the way, and arguably are making a few more right now. But code was an important move for them to say, if we're really open source, then we can do this. We are a tools company. Let's make a great cross-platform open source tool. I think last week I, I threw up a, on my Twitter account, X account, a graphic of somebody who successfully loaded VS Code into their Android car. <laughs> so they had this you know, screen in the center there, and it's, it's actually got VS Code loaded on it. And I'm like, well, there's one place to program. They said it will work anywhere. Well, there it is. But we do know that by the end of 2015, Microsoft is getting serious about buying Xamarin. Uh, part of my fun job as being the .NET Rocks guy for so long is once the deal was assured, they were going to announce it at Build. Um, we were allowed to, to interview Miguel and Nat about the acquisition ahead of the announcement. And so we sat in the crowd at Build uh, 2016. And the moment they said, we've acquired Xamarin, we could publish the show. So and, you know, they got about seven minutes to talk about that on stage, but we got an hour with them. And uh, it was a great conversation. I'm so excited for them. And now a new wave of work begins. Nat goes into the TFS side with Brian Harry as a VP. Miguel becomes a distinguished engineer, goes into the .NET side. He's still taking care of a bunch of Xamarin-related things. But they, was, there's a time, they call it kind of a time of healing inside. This is when the .NET standard starts to be talked about. Now, for us on the outside, .NET standard looked like something more for like vendors and things. But really, it was for Microsoft itself. There were several versions of .NET scattered throughout the company. Windows had their own weird setup for the things they were doing in Win8. And there was the you know, principal version that was being run by DevDiv. There was micro versions and different uh, embedded versions of it. And the same, you know, that fragmentation became a problem because they'd each added to the library a little bit different from each other. And that meant the code bases were expensive to maintain and they had different, er they did, did different errors. They weren't all using Rosalind. And so there was a goal to push back and try and unify it all into a standard set of versions. So they built, it took months to build a roadmap to say, with each version, we're gonna get closer and closer to the same. So that eventually there would be essentially one .NET. And that worked out. I mean, they've just now talked about, we don't worry about .NET standard anymore. Like we don't really have to think about it anymore because internally, they really only build one version of .NET. For the rest of the world, it's like, that's a version, just use it. So having done that, they decided, hey, let's try doing it for XAML too. Because if you thought .NET was fragmented, XAML was crazy fragmented. There was the version they were using on the phone, the version that used to be Silverlight. There was the version for WPF. There was a mutant version that lived inside of, uh, of Win8. And so they were trying to unify. And then, they, then there's Xamarin Forms, also essentially a variation of XAML. So how do you unify all these things? This did not go well. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. You're talking about some of the biggest, oldest, most experienced teams in all of the company and some of the newest recently acquired. And really, if you were trying to unify a version of XAML, you got to start with the smallest set, which is the mobile set. But the mobile set were the new guys. And there was just no political way to get them there. So Xamarin remained fragmented for quite some time. Windows 10 was a grand experiment as well. If you recall, Windows 10, they were trying to iterate quickly. It was the last version of Windows. Remember when that lie came along? We only had the last version of Windows, but they kept doing builds of Windows. Like almost every quarter, you get another version of Windows. And they were making UI improvements inside of Windows. So we had the, UI, the WinUI library, the derivative of, of UWP. But in order for you to use this, you had to ship a new version of Windows with it. 
And there's nothing funnier in this world than a developer that's committed to WinUI, that's built a great version of their app on a particular version of WinUI, and then it has to go to IT and says, I want to roll this app out. Can you update all the versions of Windows in the company? <laughs> no. So, I mean, ultimately, that was destined to fail. It did fail. And, event, and the Windows guys, Windows guys eventually figured out, A, don't keep shipping versions of Windows. You make everybody sad. And B, don't resonate SDKs with your operating system. And so WinUI started, was ready to live on its own. And Core, uh, by, by 2019, we'd gotten to Core 3.1, effe effectively feature complete from a server perspective since 3. Now we've got to deal with the client stuff. And this is when they come up with the Win SDKs. So the new version of WinForms, the one that's not pixel perfect with the old version of WinForms because it'll actually handle high DPI monitors, those kinds of breaking changes. So they're now sort of positioning themselves to say, okay, now that we have this version and we can start thinking about client UIs in a meaningful way, we'll create this space called Win SDKs and Win UI can live there too. And so from 3 1, they jumped to 5 because numbers are hard. Uh, well, they skipped 4 because, of course, the standard version was the still trapped in 4, as, as it will be forevermore, and is never going away. Windows itself has dependencies on 4.8 with no sign that they'll ever be removed. So 4.8 is important for Microsoft, irrespective of anybody else. But .NET 5 was going to be this unified platform, our ability to bring all these stacks together uh, into one happy space, and that would really be the manifestation of the .NET standard writ large. And then that's also when they committed to, and we're going to ship a version of .NET every year in November, and it's going to be great. And they did, right? We get Win 6 by November of 2021, and under the hood, there was a very important change that went on. So this is now um, three years since Xamarin has been acquired. They've been trying to rationalize XAML. But the mono stack had its own set of base class libraries separate from .NET. And in .NET 6, they were able to say, okay, let's make one set of base class libraries that everybody uses. And so that, under the hood, allowed us to unify all of that Linux stack pretty much completely. And it opened the door to this idea that we could build a multi-platform app UI for .NET, aka MAUI. So largely announced uh, as part of .NET 6, but because of the changes in the lower sets of libraries, it meant major changes to Studio. So we also had, all coming in in that November 20, 2021 period, we had a new version of Studio and a new version of uh, .NET. And the same thing we want, build a tool set that's dependent on both, which means they're trying to build on something that's changing on both ends at the same time. So uh, they didn't get there. You know, we were expecting it in, in, uh, for .NET 6, and it just wasn't really possible. I'm oh, sorry, this was 2022, uh, the uh, version of Studio. So in theory, that was, uh, you know, they had a sort of bits of it for November of 21. May of 22 was really when we saw the version of Maui they had intended to build, now that .NET and Studio had stabilized. And then in November of 22, with .NET 7, we really kind of get... I would argue v3 the, the version that works and now this past year we've gotten um dotnet 8 and a pretty feature complete version of maui and microsoft has this problem right like you're moving so many pieces simultaneously it's hard to get to a real stable happy version of things enough that enough people can work on it that you get feedback that's meaningful besides please fix your broken stuff to we're doing this in ways you haven't thought of so they can start reshaping the product and so I you know, would argue .NET 8 is the first iteration we've had of people finally seeing the changes that we're starting to have feedback on it. But it's still incredibly early days. And uh, they, part of that has been the community building the community toolkit. So with support by the Maui team, there are folks that have built other common elements for them and tried to put them in a standard uh, repository with a bunch of maintainers on it so that we can experiment here. So if you haven't played, if you're in Maui space and you haven't played with the toolkit, you're missing out. But what you're really looking at is this is a place where things that may be coming to Maui are likely to be seen first. Like if people like the stuff that's in the toolkit enough, they will bring it in to the main product, which basically mainly says Microsoft will support it effectively and definitely. So that's why it lives here first. 
is mostly in, in NuGet packages, but can open the, uh, the route forward for all of that and all the new things that are coming down the line. Uh, in the midst of all of this, Blazor emerged. Blazor was also kind of an accident. Steve Sanderson is a mad genius, and he saw WebAssembly and decided, I can make something work with that. And a key part of him making, the, he, initially what he did, because of the LLVM pipeline that is how you build WebAssembly, it's all C++ stuff, the Roslyn version of .NET wasn't going to work with that. So he actually found a weird open source custom build of C Sharp initially that he incorporated into the prototype that he showed off in 2016, actually at this conference, but in Oslo. It was the NDC in Oslo where he first showed it off. And Microsoft was a little scared of it because it kind of went after, you know, this whole WebAssembly thing was kind of anti-JavaScript. Yeah, you're going to live in the JavaScript runtime, but you're trying to replace JavaScript. Like, is that right? So it sat as an experimental project for quite some time inside of the ASP.NET um, GitHub repository, the beta side. It's just an experiment for a long time. But one of the big things that happened to Blazor was Miguel. That Miguel looked at it and went, what you're doing is cool, but you should be using Mono. And Mono is compliant with .NET standards, so it will be a normal version of .NET now. And so they rebuilt Blazor against the Mono engine because it, it came through C, the C++ pipeline so it could run through LLVM into WA. And it worked. And then as soon as they, pretty much Microsoft waited to be second on a WA programming language. They waited until Golang shipped. Like within a month of Golang coming out as a WebAssembly option so you could write Go inside of your browser, Microsoft's like, okay, fine, Blazor. I mean, the Go guys didn't get killed, so maybe we won't get killed either. Let's go put it out there. And the ecosystem detonated around it. The Telerix and the Dev Express is like all those organizations, like, let us make you some Blazor controls. Because it kind of felt like old school development. And at the same time, you had Ma Maui coming up as well. So there's kind of this confusion about these two approaches to building clients. I mean, Maui is very much the smart client development approach. And that's a tough bite for a lot of folks. Like we've been building web clients for quite some time for our customers, right? Or, or certainly our internal apps. Why? Well, because you already got a browser. Because deployment doesn't suck. Like there's a lot of good that comes from that with some limitations. And so then it's like, well, when does a smart client make sense? Can we actually write once and run lots of places? I mean, it's pretty damn hard. It's still hard, right? And, for, and we're, we're still, Customer doesn't care. Customer cares that it works on their device. They don't care that it works on everybody else's device. So it's really hard to you know, push back on the fact that it's not even on all devices. If you just built it natively on one device for them, then they'd be very happy. Other people would be sad, but you know, it's too expensive for us to write it multiple times in multiple places. So, I mean, Maui's got a tough road to hoe, but unless we have a unified smart client strategy, we have no hope at all. So the question is whether or not we're going to see features that are important. That's where I think this community toolkit is people exploring the edges of what we can do with a cross-platform smart client. If we're going to see a revelation and, oh, man, you need this client, it's going to come from here. Meantime, we've got, you know, web's not holding the still. Blazor is an interesting way for developers to build clients quickly on the web that look pretty good. Work well, you know, deal with the, the media queries. You, you have different renders. It's hard to imagine what comes after this. There are going to be more versions, but I'm waiting for a tipping point for each of these different tools to see like what's going to have that breakthrough that's going to be the compelling tool. Now, we've kind of been stuck in the same device form factor for a while. Everybody's got a slab of black glass, some kind of variation on a laptop. I mean, maybe VR is going to disrupt this. Uh, maybe we're just going to have new demands on on our software, but look, if you're living in forms over data, you got a lot of choices. Pick the language you understand, embrace the whole tool suite, figure out what the IT guys will live with in terms of deployment, because that's always a bar bigger than you think. You know, if you want to actually make a friend before you commit to the app, go talk to the team about the, who's going to roll it out and what it's going to take to do that. It's one thing to push a build up to a web server and everybody gets it. It's another thing to say, 15,000 seats, go. Right? That's not easy, and so it's worth thinking about. But the tooling is getting better around that, and I'm excited to see what comes next. But I'm really at a place where like, it's not obvious what's next now. They are feeling around for the best, best ideas, and that's why the community is so heavily involved, and I hope you'll be a part of that.
Thanks for your time. I guess that's lunch.